Hello, my name is Hannah, and I am going to read I Can Read the Little Prince, level four. Do you want to join me? Let's read together. Chapter one. One, when I was six years old, I saw a fantastic picture in a book called True Stories from Nature about the jungle forest. It was a picture of a boa snake in the act of eating an animal. Here is a copy of the drawing. In the book, it said, boa snakes eat animals without biting it. After that, they cannot move and will sleep for six months until the next hunt. I fell into that book, The Adventures of the Jungle, and after some work with a pencil, I succeeded in making my first drawing. My drawing number one, it looked like this. I showed my drawing to the grown-ups. Does this drawing scare you? I asked them. But they answered, scared? Why should anyone be scared by a hat? My drawing was not a picture of a hat. It was a picture of a boa snake keeping an elephant in its body. But the grown-ups were not able to understand it. So I made another drawing. I drew the inside of the boa snake. Now the grown-ups were able to understand it clearly. They always need an explanation. My drawing number two looked like this. The grown-ups advised me this time, stop drawing boa snakes. Instead, focus on geography, history, and grammar. That is why I gave up being a great painter at six years old. I had been disappointed by the failure of my drawing number one and number two. Grown-ups never understand anything by themselves. And it's tiring for children to explain everything to grown-ups. So, I chose another job. I learned to pilot airplanes. I have flown to all parts of the world. And it is true that geography has been very useful to me. Very quickly, I can distinguish China from Arizona. If I get lost at night, such knowledge is useful. During this lifetime, I have met many people who have been concerned about important matters. I have seen them closely, and that didn't much change my opinion of them. When I met a very clear-sighted person, I tried the test of showing him my drawing number one. I have always kept my drawing number one. I would try to find out if he was of real understanding, but whoever it was, he or she would always say, that is a hat. Then I would never talk to that person about boa snakes or jungle forests or stars. I would bring myself down to his level. I would talk to him about card games and golf and politics and neckties. And the grown-up would be happy to have met such a sensible man. Chapter two. So I lived my life alone with no one to really talk to until I had an accident in the desert of Sahara six years ago. Something was broken in my engine and there was me, neither a mechanic nor any passengers. I had to make repairs by myself. I decided to try a difficult repair by myself. It was a question of life or death for me. I only had drinking water to last a week. The first night, I went to sleep on the sand, a thousand miles from any human town. I was more alone than a broken ship's sailor on a piece of wood in the ocean. So, you can imagine my surprise at sunrise. I was awakened by a strange little voice. It said, if you please, draw me a sheep. What? Draw me a sheep. I jumped to my feet, completely shocked. I blinked my eyes hard. 
I looked carefully all around me, and I saw a most strange small person who stood there looking at me with great seriousness. Here. You may see the best drawing of the person that I was able to make later, but my drawing is surely very much less charming than its model. However, that is not my fault. The grown-ups discouraged me in my dream of being a painter when I was six years old, and I never learned to draw anything except boa snakes. Now. I looked at this unexpected appearance with my eyes almost starting out of my head in surprise. Remember, I had crashed in the desert, a thousand miles from any human area, and yet my little man seemed neither to be lost nor unsure among the sands, nor to be shocked from the tiredness or the hunger or thirst or fear. Nothing about him gave any suggestion of a child lost in the desert, a thousand miles from any human town. At last, when I was able to speak, I said to him, "What are you doing here?" And in answer, he repeated, very slowly, as if he were speaking of a matter of great importance, "If you please." Draw me a sheep. When a mystery is too overpowering, nobody can disobey. Crazy as it might seem to me, a thousand miles from any human town and in danger of death, I took out of my pocket a sheet of paper and my pen. But then I remembered how my studies had been focused on geography, history, and grammar. So I told the little man. A little upset, but I didn't know how to draw. He answered me, "That doesn't matter. Draw me a sheep." But I had never drawn a sheep, so I drew him one of the two pictures I often drew. It was that of the boa snake from the outside, and I was shocked to hear the little boy react to it with. No, no! I do not want an elephant inside a boa snake. A boa snake is a very dangerous animal, and an elephant is very heavy. Where I live, everything is very small. What I need is a sheep. Draw me a sheep. So then, I made a drawing. He looked at it carefully. Then he said, "No." The sheep is already very sickly. Make me another. So, I made another drawing. My friend smiled gently and kindly. Look at this, he said. This is not a sheep. This is a ram. It has horns. So then I did my drawing over once more, but it was rejected too, just like the others. This one is too old. By this time, my patience was gone because I was in a hurry to start to uncover my engine. So I tossed off this drawing and I threw out an explanation. This is only his box. The sheep you want is inside. I was very surprised to see the face of my young judge brighten. That is exactly the way I wanted it. Do you think that this sheep will have a great deal of grass? Why? Because where I live, everything is very small. There will surely be enough grass for him, I said. It is a very small sheep that I have given you. He looked at the drawing. Not so small that. Look, he has gone to sleep. And that is how I made friends with the little prince. Chapter three. It took me a long time to learn where he came from. The little prince, who asked me so many questions, 
but he never seemed to hear what I asked him. It was from words dropped by chance. Little by little, everything was known to me. The first time he saw my airplane, for example, he asked me, "What is that thing?" That is not a thing. It flies. It is an airplane. It is my airplane. I shall not draw my airplane. That would be very difficult for me. And I was proud to have him learn that I could fly. He cried out then, "What? You drop down from the sky?" Yes, I answered quietly. Oh, that is funny. And the little prince broke into lovely laughter. The sound of his laughter annoyed me very much. I like my unlucky situation to be taken seriously. Then he added, "So you too come from the sky. Which is your planet?" At that moment, I caught the light of his hard-to-understand presence, and I demanded suddenly. Do you come from another planet? But he did not reply. He tossed his head gently, without taking his eyes from my plane. It is true that on that you can't have come from very far away, he said, and he sank into a daydream for a long time. Then, taking my sheep out of his pocket, he meditated about his treasure deeply. You can imagine how my curiosity was aroused by this half confidence about the other planets. I made a great effort, therefore, to find out more on this subject. My little man, where do you come from? What is this where I live of which you speak? Where do you want to take your sheep? After thinking in silence, he answered. The box you have given me, at night he can use as his house. That is so, and if you are good, I will also give you a string so that you can tie him during the day, and a post to tie him to. But the little prince seemed shocked by this offer. Tie him? What an odd idea! But if you don't tie him, I said. He will go off somewhere and get lost. My friend broke into another loud laughter. But where do you think he would go? Anywhere, straight ahead of him. Then the little prince said seriously, "That doesn't matter. On my planet, everything is so small." And, with a little bit of sadness, he added. Straight ahead of him, nobody can go very far. Chapter Four. Thus, I had learned a second fact of great importance: the planet the little prince came from was only just larger than a house. But that did not really surprise me much. I knew very well the great planets, such as the Earth, Jupiter, Mars. Venus, to which we have given names, and there are also hundreds of planets. Some of them are so small, it is hard to see them through the telescope. When an astronomer discovers one of these, he does not give it a name, but only a number, like asteroid three two five. I have serious reason to believe that the little prince came from the asteroid known as. B six one two. This asteroid has been seen through a telescope. That was by a Turkish astronomer in nineteen o nine. The astronomer had presented it to the IAC, International Astronomical Congress. It was a great presentation, but he was in Turkish costume, and so nobody could believe what he said. Grown-ups are like that. Fortunately, asteroid B612 is more popular. An absolute Turkish leader made a law. The law was that his subjects should change to European costume. 
If they don't, they will die. So, in 1920, the astronomer gave his presentation all over again, dressed with excellent style and grace. And this time, everybody accepted his report. If I have told you these details about the asteroid and made a note of its number for you, it is because of the grown-ups and their ways. When you tell them that you have made a new friend, they never ask you any questions about important matters. What does his voice sound like? What games does he love best? Does he collect butterflies? Instead, they demand, how old is he? How many brothers has he? How much does he weigh? How much money does his father make? Only from these numbers do they think they have learned anything about him. If you were to say to the grown-ups, I saw a beautiful house made of rosy brick with flower pots in the windows, they would not be able to get any idea of that house at all. You would have to say to them, I saw a house that cost $20,000. Then they would explain, Oh, what a pretty house that is. Surely you might say to them, the fact that the little prince existed is that he was charming, that he laughed, and that he was looking for a sheep. If anybody wants a sheep, that is the fact that he exists. What's the use of telling them so? They would move their shoulders up and down and treat you like a child. But if you said to them, the planet he came from is asteroid B612, then they would be sure and make you peaceful from their questions. They are like that. You must not blame them. Children should always show great patience to grown-up people. But, yes, numbers don't really matter to us who really understand life. I should have liked to begin this story in the style of the fairy tales. I should have liked to say, once upon a time, there was a little prince who lived on a planet that was just only bigger than himself and who had need of a sheep. To those who understand life, that would have given a much greater feel of truth to my story. I do not want anyone to read my book carelessly. I have had too much sorrow in setting down these memories. Six years have already passed since my friend went away from me with his sheep. If I try to describe him here, it's to make sure that I shall not forget him. To forget a friend is sad, and if I forget him, I may become like the grown-ups who are interested in figures' numbers. It is for that purpose that I have bought a box of paints and some pencils. It is hard to start drawing again at my age when I have never made any pictures except those of the boa snake from the outside and the inside boa snake since I was six. I shall surely try to make human drawings as true as possible, but I am not at all sure of success. One drawing goes all right, and another is not the same as its subject. I make some errors in the little prince's height. In one place, he is too tall, and in another, too short. And I feel some doubt about his clothing color. So I go step by step along as best I can, now good, now bad, and I hope generally average. Surely more important details, I shall make mistakes also. But that is something that will not be my fault. My friend never explained anything to me. He thought that I was like himself. But I, sadly, do not know how to see sheep through the walls of boxes. Perhaps I am a little like the grown-ups. I have had to grow old. Chapter 5 As each day passed, I would learn something about the little prince's planet his departure from his planet, his journey. The information would come very slowly. Sometimes it falls from his thoughts. This way that I had heard 
on the third day about the problem of the baobabs. This time, once more, I had the sheep to thank for it. For the little prince asked me suddenly, as if captured by a serious doubt, It is true, isn't it, that sheep eat little bushes? Yes, that is true. Ah, I am glad. I did not understand why it was so important that sheep should eat little bushes. But the little prince added, And after that, they also eat baobabs? I pointed out to the little prince that baobabs were not little bushes. Baobabs, on the opposite, are trees as big as a castle. And that, even if he took a whole group of elephants away with him, the elephants group would not eat up one single baobab. The idea of the group of elephants made the little prince laugh. We would have to put them one on top of the other, <laughs> he said. But he made a wise comment. Before they grow so big, the baobabs start out by being little. That is correct, I said. But why do you want the sheep to eat the little baobabs? He answered me at once. Oh, come, come, as if to say something that was clear. And I had to make a great mental effort to solve this problem without any assistance. Surely, as I learned, there were on the planet where the little prince lived, as on all planets, good plants and bad plants. So there were good seeds from good plants and bad seeds from bad plants. But seeds are unseen. They sleep deep in the heart of the earth's darkness until some seed among them is captured with the desire to wake up. Then this little seed will stretch itself and begin, shyly at first, to push a charming small branch harmless upward toward the sun. If it is a small vegetable or flower, we should let it grow. But when it is a bad plant, one must destroy it as soon as possible, the very first time that one knows it. Now, there were some bad seeds on the planet that was the home of the little prince, and these were the seeds of the baobab. The ground of that planet was filled with them. A baobab is something you will never, ever be able to remove if you take care of it too late. It spreads over the whole planet. It drills clear through it with its roots. And if the planet is too small and the baobabs are too many, they split it into pieces. It is a question of practice, the little prince said to me later on. When you've finished your own toilet in the morning, then it is time to work to the toilet of your planet with the greatest care. You must see to it that you pull up regularly all the baobabs at the very first moment when they can be identified from the rose bushes which they looked like so closely in their earliest youth. It is very boring work, the little prince added, but very easy. And one day he said to me, you ought to make a beautiful drawing so your planet children can see exactly how all this is. That would be very useful to them if they were to travel someday. Sometimes there is no harm in putting off a piece of work until another day. But when it is a problem of baobabs, that always means a disaster. I knew a planet that lived by a lazy man he ignored three little bushes. The little prince described it to me, and I have made a drawing of that planet. I don't like to talk like a moral person, but the danger of the baobabs is so little known, and there is a danger for anyone who gets lost on a small planet. So I am breaking my character for the first time. Children, I say plainly, Watch out for the baobabs. My friends have been ignoring this danger for a long time, 
without ever knowing it. That's why I have worked so hard over this drawing. The lesson which I show in the drawing is worth the trouble. Perhaps you will ask me, why are there no other drawing in this book so amazing and so powerful as this drawing of the Baobabs? The reply is simple. I have tried, but I have not been successful with the others. When I made the drawing of the Baobabs, I was carried by a large force of important necessity. Chapter 6 Oh, little prince! Bit by bit, I came to understand the secrets of your sad life. For a long time, you had found your only enjoyment in the quiet joy of looking at the sunset. I learned that new detail on the morning of the fourth day when you said to me, I really love sunsets. Come, let's go look at a sunset now. But we must wait, I said. Wait? For what? For the sunset. We must wait until it is time. At first, you seemed to be very surprised. And then you laughed to yourself. You said to me, <laughs> I am always thinking that I am at home. Surely, everybody knows that when it is noon in the United States, France has sunsets. If you could fly to France in one minute, you could go straight into the sunset. Unfortunately, France is too far away. But on your tiny planet, all you need to do is move your chair a few steps. You can see the day end and the sunset falling whenever you like. One day, you said to me, I saw the sunset 44 times. And a little later, you said, You know how I love the sunset when I am so sad. Were you so sad on that day of the 44 sunsets? I asked. But the little prince made no reply. Chapter 7 On the fifth day, the secret of the little prince's life was uncovered to me. As always, it was thanks to the sheep. Suddenly, without anything to reason, and as if the question had been born of deep and silent thinking on his problem, he asked, A sheep, if it eats little bushes, does it eat flowers too? A sheep eats anything it finds in its reach, I answered. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes even flowers that have thorns. Then the thorns, what use are they? I did not know. At that moment, I was very busy trying to unscrew a bolt in my engine. I was very much worried, for it was becoming to me that the breakdown of my plane was very serious, and I had so little drinking water left that I had to fear for the worst. The thorns! What use are they? The little prince never let go of a question once he had asked it. As for me, I was upset over that bolt. And I answered with the first thing that came into my head. The thorns are of no use at all. Flowers have thorns because they are not nice. Oh! There was a moment of silence. Then, the little prince suddenly answered with anger. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They are innocent. They protect themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons. I did not answer. At that moment, I was saying to myself, if this bolt still won't turn, I am going to remove it with the hammer. Again, the little prince stopped my thoughts. And you actually believe that the flowers... Oh, no, I cried. No, no, no. I don't believe anything. I answered you with the first thing that came into my head. Don't you see? I am very busy with matters of consequence. He stared at me, thunderstruck. Matters of consequence? I had my hammer in my hand my fingers black with engine oil, 
bending down over an ugly object. You talk just like the grown-ups. That made me a little ashamed. But he went on, merciless. You mix everything up together. You confuse everything. He was really very angry. He tossed his golden curly hair all over. I know a planet where there is a special red-faced gentleman. He has never smelled a flower. He has never looked at a star. He has never loved anyone. He has never done anything in his life but adds up numbers. And all day he says over and over, just like you, I am busy with matters of consequence. And that makes him increase with pride. But he is not a man. He is a mushroom. A what? A mushroom. The little prince was now white with anger. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. And is it not a matter of a consequence to try to understand why the flowers work hard to make useless thorns? Is the war between the sheep and the flowers not important? Is it not more important than a fat, red-faced gentleman's sums? And if I know one flower which is unique in the world, which grows nowhere but on my planet, but one little sheep can destroy it in a single bite some morning without any noise, what he is doing, oh, you think that is not important? His face turned from white to red as he continued. If someone loves a flower which grows only on one star, it is enough to make him happy to look at the stars. He can say to himself, somewhere my flower is there. But if the sheep eats the flower, in one moment all his stars will be darkened. And you think that is not important? He could not say anything more. His words were choked by crying. The night had fallen. I had let my tools drop from my hands. Right now, my tools, thirst, or death did not matter. On one star, one planet, my planet, the Earth, there was a little prince to be comforted. I took him in my arms and rocked him. I said to him, The flower that you love is not in danger. I will draw you a mask for your sheep. I will draw you a fence to put around your flower. I will. I did not know what to say to him. I felt uncomfortable and wrong. I did not know how I could reach him, where I could overtake him and go on hand in hand with him once more. It is such a secret place, the land of tears. Chapter 8 Soon I learned to know this flower better. On the little prince's planet, the flowers had always been very simple. They had only one ring of petals. They took no space at all. They were a trouble to nobody. One morning they would appear in the grass, and by night they would have faded peacefully away. But one day, a seed blew from somewhere. A new flower had come up, and the little prince had watched very closely over this small sprout. It was not like any other small sprouts on his planet. It might have been a new kind of baobab. The shrub soon stopped growing and began to get ready to flower. The little prince saw the first coming of a huge bud. He felt at once that some kind of awesome thing must come up from it. But the flower was not satisfied to complete the plans for her beauty in the shelter of her green room. She chose her colors with the highest care. She dressed slowly. She set her petals one by one. She did not wish to go out into the world all messy, like the field flowers. It was only in the full brightness of her beauty that she wished to appear. Oh, yes, she was an attractive creature, and her fantastic beauty lasted for days and days. Then, one morning, she suddenly showed herself, and 
After walking with all this extremely carefully detailed, she yawned and said, Oh, I am hardly awake. I beg that you will excuse me. My petals are still all messy. But the little prince could not hold his surprise. Oh, how beautiful you are. Am I not? The flower replied sweetly. And I was born at the same moment as the sun. The little prince could guess easily enough that she was too proud. But how exciting she was. I think it's time for breakfast, she added a second later. If you would kindly think about my needs. And the little prince, completely confused, went to look for fresh water. So he took care of the flower. So she began very quickly to stress him with her self-love too. Honestly, it is difficult to deal with. For example, one day she was speaking of her four thorns. She said to the little prince, Let the tigers come with their claws. There are no tigers on my planet, the little prince disagreed. And tigers do not eat wild plants. I am not a wild plant, the flower replied sweetly. Please excuse me. I am not at all afraid of tigers, she went on, but I have a horror of wind. I guess you have a screen for me? A horror of winds? That is bad luck for a plant, commented the little prince, and added to himself, this flower is a very complex creature. At night, I want you to put me under a glass cup. It is very cold where you live, in the place where I came from. But she stopped saying herself at that point. She had come from a seed. She could not have known anything of any other worlds. Embarrassed about being caught saying a lie, she coughed two or three times and tried to blame the little prince. The screen? I was just going to look for it when you spoke to me. Then she forced her cough a little more so that he could suffer from regret. So the little prince, in spite of all the good will that was from his love, had soon come to doubt her. He had taken seriously worlds which were without importance. Finally, it made him very unhappy. I ought not to have listened to her, he said his mind to me one day. No one ought to listen to the flowers. One should simply look at them and breathe their smell. My flower perfumed all my planet, but I did not know how to enjoy all her grace. This story of claws, which upset me so much, I should only have filled my heart with kindness and pity. And he continued to say his mind. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. I should have judged by acts and not by words. She tossed her smell and her brightness over me. I should never have run away from her. I should have guessed all the love that behind her poor little bad word. Flowers are so illogical. But I was too young to know how to love her. Chapter 9 I believe that for his escape, he used the moving of a group of wild birds. On the morning of his departure, he cleaned his planet perfectly. He carefully cleaned out his active volcanoes. He had two active volcanoes, and they were very helpful for heating his breakfast in the morning. He also had one volcano that was dead. But as he said, one never knows. So he cleaned out the dead volcano too. If they are well cleaned out, volcanoes burn slowly and steadily without any explosions. Volcanic lava is like a fire in a fireplace. On our earth, we are surely much too small to clean out our volcanoes. That is why they bring no end of trouble on us. The little prince also pulled up the last little shoots of the baobabs with a certain sense of sadness. He believed that he would never want to return. But on this last morning, all these familiar tasks seemed very precious to him. 
and when he watered the flower for the last time and prepared to place her under the shelter of her glass cup, he realized that he was very close to tears. Goodbye, he said to the flower, but she made no answer. Goodbye, he said again. The flower coughed, but it was not because she had a cold. I have been silly, she said to him at last. I ask your forgiveness. Try to be happy. He was surprised by this absence of complaints. He stood there, all confused, the glass cup held in midair. He did not understand this quiet sweetness. Of course, I love you, the flower said to him. It is my fault that you have not known it all the time. That is not important, but you, you have been just as foolish as I. Try to be happy. Let the glass cup be. I don't want it anymore. But the wind! My cold is not so bad as all that. The cool night air will do me good. I am a flower. But the animals! Well, I must endure two or three worms if I wish to become friends with the butterflies. It seems that they are very beautiful, and if not the butterflies and the worms, who will call upon me? You will be far away. As for the large animals, I am not at all afraid of any of them. I have my claws. And she showed her four thorns. Then she added, Don't stay like this. You have decided to go away. Now go. For she did not want him to see her crying. She was such a proud flower. Chapter 10 He found himself in the neighborhood of the small planets 325, 326, 327, 328, 329, and 330. He began visiting them to add to his knowledge. On the first of them lived a king, he had on a royal purple and white fur. He was seated on a royal chair, which was simple and royal. Ah, oh, here is a subject, cried out the king when he saw the little prince coming. And the little prince asked himself, how could he know me when he had never seen me before? He did not know how the world is simplified for kings. To them, all men are subjects. Come closely so that I may see you better, said the king, who felt proud of being, at last, a king over somebody. The little prince looked everywhere to find a place to sit down, but all of the planet was filled and blocked by the king's amazing white fur dress. So he remained standing upright. And, since he was tired, he yawned. It is opposing to good manners to yawn in the presence of a king, the king said to him. I forbid you to yawn. I can't help it. I can't stop myself, replied the little prince, totally ashamed. I have come on a long journey, and I have had no sleep. Ah, then, the king said, I order you to yawn. It is years since I have seen anyone yawning. Yawns are subjects of interest for me. Come now, yawn again. It is an order. That scares me. I cannot anymore, the little prince said in a low voice, now completely abashed. Hum hum, replied the king. Then I, I order you sometimes to yawn and sometimes to... He repeated words a little, and seemed angry. For what the king basically wanted was that his authority should be respected. He didn't accept disobedience. He was an absolute king. But because he was a very good man, he made his orders reasonable. He would say, by way of example, if I ordered a general to change himself into a seabird, and if the general did not obey me, that would not be the fault of the general. It would be my fault. May I sit down? Came now a shy question from the little prince. 
I order you to do so, the king answered him, and royally gathered in a fold of his fur dress. But the little prince was wondering. The planet was tiny. Over what could this king really rule? Sire, he said to him, would you excuse my asking you a question? I order you to ask me a question, the king hurried to assure him. Sire, over what do you rule? Over everything, said the king with simplicity. Over everything? The king waved his hand towards the other planets and all the stars. Over all that? asked the little prince. Over all that, the king answered. For his rule was not only absolute, it was also universal. And the stars obey you? Certainly they do, the king said. They obey instantly. I do not allow disobedience. Such power was a thing for the little prince to wonder at. If he had been a master of such force, he would have been able to watch the sunset, not 44 times in one day, but 72, or even 100, or even 200 times, without ever having to move his chair. And because he felt a bit sad as he remembered his little planet which he had left, he took up his courage to ask the king a favor. I should like to see a sunset. Do me that kindness. Order the sun to set. If I ordered a general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, or to write an awful drama, or to change himself into a seabird, and if the general did not carry out the order, which one of us would be in the wrong? The king asked. The general or myself? You said the little prince firmly. Exactly. One requires to do what each one can perform, the king went on. First of all, accepted authority rests on reason. If you ordered your people to go and throw themselves into the sea, they would rise up in revolution. I have the right to require obedience because my orders are reasonable. Then my sunset? The little prince reminded him, for he never forgot a question once he had asked it. You shall have your sunset. I shall command it. But, according to my scientist, I shall wait until conditions are agreeable. When will that be? questioned the little prince. Hum hum, replied the king. And before saying anything else, he consulted a heavy yearbook. Hum hum. That will be this evening, about 20 minutes to 8, and you will see how well I am obeyed. The little prince yawned. He was feeling sorry for his lost sunset, and he was already beginning to be a little bored, too. I have nothing more to do here, he said to the king, so I shall set out on my way again. Do not go, said the king who was very proud of having a subject. Do not go. I will make you a minister. Minister of what? Minister of, of justice. But there is nobody here to judge. We do not know that, the king said to him. I have not yet made a complete tour of my kingdom. I am very old. There is no room here for a cart, and I am tired to walk. Oh, but I have looked already said the little prince, turning around to give one more check to the other side of the planet. On that side, there was nobody at all. Then you shall judge yourself, the king answered. That is the most difficult thing of all. It is much more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. If you succeed in judging yourself rightly, then you are indeed a man of true wisdom. Yes, said the little prince. But I can judge myself anywhere. I do not need to live on this planet. Hum hum, said the king. I believe that somewhere on my planet there is an old rat. I hear him at night. You can judge this old rat. Sometimes you will judge him to death. Thus his life will depend on your justice. 
but he will pardon him each time, for he must be treated with care. He is the only one we have. I do not like to judge anyone to death, replied the little prince, and now I think I will go on my way. No, said the king, but the little prince, having now completed his preparations for departure, had no wish to feel sorry for the old king. If you wish to be immediately obeyed, he said, you should be able to give me a reasonable order. For example, to order me to be gone by the end of one minute. It seems to me that conditions are agreeable. As the king made no answer, the little prince hesitated a moment. Then he took his leave with a sigh. I make you my ambassador, the king called out quickly. He had an awesome mood of authority. The grown-ups are very strange, the little prince said to himself as he continued on his journey. Chapter 11 The second planet was settled by a proud man. Ah, ah! I am about to receive a visit from an admirer, he cried out from far away when he first saw the little prince coming. For proud men, all other men are admirers. Good morning, said the little prince. That is an odd hat you are wearing. It is a hat for greeting, the proud man replied. It is to raise in greeting when people praise me. Unfortunately, nobody passes this way. Yes, said the little prince, who did not understand what the proud man was talking about. Clap your hands, one against the other, the proud man now directed him. The little prince clapped his hands. The proud man raised his hat in a modest greeting. This is more entertaining than the visit to the king, the little prince said to himself. And he began again to clap his hands, one against the other, the proud man again raising his hat in greeting. After five minutes of this exercise, the little prince grew tired of the game's ease. And what should one do to make the hat come down? he asked. But the proud man did not hear him. Proud people never hear anything but praise. Do you really admire me very much? He demanded of the little prince. What does that mean? Admire. To admire means that you consider me as the most handsome, the best dressed, the richest, and the most intelligent man on this planet. But you are the only man on your planet. Do me this kindness. Admire me. Just the same. I admire you, said the little prince, moving his shoulders lightly. But what about that would interest you so much? And the little prince went away. The grown-ups are certainly very odd, he said to himself as he continued on his journey. Chapter 12 The next planet was settled by an alcoholic. This was a very short visit, but it dropped the little prince into a deep depression. What are you doing here? He said to the alcoholic, whom he found settled down before a collection of empty bottles and also a collection of full bottles. I am drinking, replied the alcoholic with a gloomy mood. Why are you drinking? demanded the little prince. So that I may forget replied the alcoholic. Forget what? questions the little prince, who already was sorry for him. Forget that I am ashamed, the alcoholic confessed, dropping his head. Ashamed of what? replied the little prince, who wanted to help him. Ashamed of drinking! The alcoholic brought his speech to an end and shut himself up in an unshakable silence. And the little prince went away, confused. The grown-ups are certainly very, very odd, he said to himself as he continued on his journey. Chapter 13 The fourth planet belonged to a businessman. This man was so much occupied that he did not even raise his head at the little prince's arrival. Good morning, 
the little prince said to him. Your cigarette has gone out. Three and two make five. Five and seven make twelve. Twelve and three make fifteen. Good morning. Fifteen and seven make twenty-two. Twenty-two and six make twenty-eight. I haven't time to light it again. Twenty-six and five make thirty-one. Whew. Then that makes five hundred and one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirty-one. Five hundred million? What? Asked the little prince. Eh, are you still there? Five hundred and one million. I can't stop. I have so much to do. I am concerned with important work. I don't amuse myself with nonsense. Two and five make seven. Five hundred and one million. What? Repeated the little prince, who never let go of a question once he had asked it. The businessman raised his head. During the fifty-four years that I have lived on this planet, I have been disturbed only three times. The first time was twenty-two years ago, when some dizzy goose fell from God knows where. He made an awful noise that echoed all over the place, and I made four mistakes in my edition. The second time, eleven years ago, I was disturbed by an attack of joint pain. I don't get enough exercise. I have no time to laze around. The third time, well, this is it. Then I was saying five hundred and one millions, millions of what? The businessman suddenly realized that there was no chance of peace until he answered this question. Millions of those little objects, he said, which one sometimes sees in the sky, flies. Oh no, little shining objects. Bees. Oh no. Little golden objects that set lazy men to unrealistic dreaming. As for me, I am concerned with important work. There is no time for unrealistic dreaming in my life. Ah, you mean the stars? Yes, that's it, the stars. And what do you do with five hundred millions of stars? Five hundred and one million six hundred twenty-two thousand seven hundred thirty-one. I am concerned with important work. I am an exact person. And what do you do with these stars? What do I do with them? Yes. Nothing. I own them. You own the stars? Yes. But I have already seen a king who. Kings do not own. They rule over. It is a very different matter. And what good does it do you to own the stars? It does me the good of making me rich. And what good does it do you to be rich? It makes it possible for me to buy more stars if any are discovered. This man, the little prince said to himself, reasons a little like my poor alcoholic. Nevertheless, he still had some more questions. How is it possible for one to own the stars? To whom do they belong? The businessman replied, angrily. I don't know. To nobody. Then they belong to me because I was the first person to think of it. Is that all that is necessary? Certainly. When you find a diamond that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you discover an island that belongs to nobody, it is yours. When you get an idea before anyone else, you make out a copyright on it. It is yours, just like that. I own the stars because nobody else before me ever thought of owning them. Yes, that is true," said the little prince. "And what do you do with them?" "I administer them," replied the businessman. "I count them and I recount them. It is difficult, but I am a man who is naturally interested in important work." The little prince was still not satisfied. If I owned a silk scarf, he said, I could put it around my neck and take it away with me. If I owned a flower, I could pick that flower and take it away with me. But you cannot pick the stars from heaven. No, but I can put them in the bank. Whatever does that mean? 
That means that I write the number of my stars on a little paper and then I put this paper in a drawer and lock it with a key. And that is all? That is enough, said the businessman. It is entertaining, thought the little prince. It is rather poetic, but it is of no great importance. On matters of importance, the little prince had ideas which were very different from those of grown-ups. I myself own a flower, he continued his conversation with the businessman, which I water every day. I own three volcanoes, which I clean out every week. It is useful to my volcanoes, and it is useful to my flower that I own them. But you are of no use to the stars. The businessman opened his mouth, but he found nothing to say in answer, and the little prince went away. The grown-ups here are certainly altogether very unusual, he said simply, talking to himself as he continued on his journey. Chapter 14 The fifth planet was very strange. It was the smallest of all. There was just enough room on it for a street lamp and a lamp lighter. The little prince can't understand the reason for the use of a street lamp and a lamp lighter on a planet which had no people and not one house. But he said to himself, it may be that this man is unreasonable, but he is not so unreasonable as the king, the proud man, the businessman, and the alcoholic, for at least his work has some meaning. And when he lights his street lamp, it looks like he brought one more star to life, or one flower. When he puts out his lamp, he sends the flower, or the star, to sleep. That is a beautiful job, and since it is beautiful, it is truly useful. When he arrived on the planet, he respectfully greeted the lamplighter. Good morning! Why have you just put out your lamp? Those are the orders, replied the lamplighter. Good morning. What are the orders? The orders are that I put out my lamp. Good evening. And then he lighted his lamp again. But why have you just lighted it again? Those are the orders, replied the lamplighter. I do not understand, said the little prince. There is nothing to understand, said the lamplighter. Orders are orders. Good morning. And he put out his lamp. Then he wiped his forehead with a handkerchief with red squares. I follow a terrible work. In the old days, it was reasonable. I put the lamp out in the morning, and in the evening I lighted it again. I had the rest of the day for leisure and the rest of the night for sleep. And the orders have been changed since that time? The orders have not been changed, said the lamplighter. That is the disaster. From year to year the planet has turned more rapidly and the others have not been changed. Then what? asked the little prince. Then the planet now makes a complete turn every minute, and I no longer have one single second for rest. Once every minute I have to light my lamp and put it out. That is very funny. A day lasts only one minute. This planet! It is not funny at all, said the lamplighter. While we have been talking together, a month has gone by. A month? Yes, a month. Thirty minutes, thirty days. Good evening and he lighted his lamp again. As the little prince watched him, he felt that he loved this lamplighter who was so faithful to his orders. He remembered when he moved his chair back to see the sunsets, and he wanted to help his friend. You know, he said, I can tell you a way you can rest whenever you want to. I always want to rest, said the lamplighter, for it is possible for a man to be faithful and lazy at the same time. The little prince went on with his explanation. Your planet is so small that three steps will take you all the way around it. When you want rest, you will walk slowly and the day will last as long as you like. That doesn't do me much good, said the lamplighter. The one thing I love is to sleep. Then you are lucky, said the little prince. I am unlucky said the lamplighter. Good morning. And he put out his lamp. The little prince said to himself, 
as he continued on his journey. That man would be hated by all the others, by the king, by the proud man, by the alcoholic, by the businessman. Nevertheless, he is the only one of them who does not look ridiculous. Perhaps that is because he is thinking of something except himself. He breathed a sigh of regret and said to himself again, that man is the only one of them who I could have made my friend. But his planet is really too small. There is no room on it for two people. What the little prince hid in his heart was that he was sorry most of all to leave this planet because it was blessed every day with 1,440 sunsets. Chapter 15 The sixth planet was ten times larger than the last one. It was lived by an old gentleman who wrote large books. Oh, look, here is an explorer, he shouted to himself when he saw the little prince coming. The little prince sat down on the table and breathed quickly. He had already traveled so much and so far. Where do you come from? The old gentleman said to him. What is that big book? said the little prince. What are you doing? I am a geographer, said the old gentleman. What is a geographer? asked the little prince. A geographer is a scholar who knows the location of all the seas, rivers, towns, mountains, and deserts. That is very interesting, said the little prince. At last, here is a man who has a real job and he looked around him at the planet of the geographer. It was the most amazing and grand planet that he had ever seen. Your planet is very beautiful, he said. Has it any oceans? I couldn't tell you, said the geographer. Ah, the little prince was disappointed. Has it any mountain, said the geographer. And towns? and rivers and deserts? I couldn't tell you that either. But you are a geographer. Exactly, the geographer said. But I am not an explorer. I haven't a single explorer on my planet. It is not the geographer who goes out to count the towns, the rivers, the mountains, the seas, the oceans, and the deserts. The geographer is much too important to waste time he does not leave his desk. The scientist went on. So he receives the explorers in his study. He asks them questions and he notes down the memories of their travels. And if the memories of explorers seem interesting to him, the geographer orders a question into that explorer's moral character. Why is that? because an explorer who told lies would bring disaster on the books of the geographer. So would an explorer who drank too much. Why is that? asked the little prince. Because drunken men see double. Then the geographer would note two mountains when there was only one. I know someone, said the little prince, who would make a bad explorer. That is possible. Then, when the moral character of the explorer is shown to be good, a search is ordered about the discovery. One goes to see it? Oh, that would be too complicated. But one requires the explorer to supply data. For example, if the discovery in question is that of a large mountain, one requires that large stones be brought back from it. The geographer was suddenly moved to joy. But you, you come from far away. You are an explorer. You shall describe your planet to me. And having opened his big book, the geographer sharpened his pencil. The reports of explorers are put down first in pencil. One waits until the explorer has supplied data before putting them down in ink. Well, said the geographer hopefully. Oh. Where I live, said the little prince, it is not very interesting. It is so small. I have three volcanoes, 
Two volcanoes are active, and the other is dead. But one never knows. One never knows," said the geographer. "I also have a flower." "We do not record flowers," said the geographer. "Why is that? The flower is the most beautiful thing on my planet." "We do not record them," said the geographer, "because they are short-lived." What does that mean? Short-lived. Geography books are most concerned with matters of importance," said the scientist. "They never become old-fashioned. It is very rarely that a mountain changes its position. It is very rarely that an ocean empties of its waters. We write of unchanging things." "But dead volcanoes may come to life again." The little prince interrupted. "What does that mean? Short-lived. Whether volcanoes are dead or alive, it comes to the same thing for us," said the geographer. "The thing that matters to us is the mountain. It does not change." "But what does it mean? Short-lived," repeated the little prince, who never in his life had to let go of a question. It means, which is in danger of speedy disappearance. Is my flower in danger of speedy disappearance? Certainly, it is. My flower is short-lived, the little prince said to himself, and she has only four thorns to defend herself against the world, and I have left her on my planet, all. Alone. That was his first moment of regret, but he took courage once more. What place would you advise me to visit now? He asked. The planet Earth, replied the geographer. It is well known. And the little prince went away, thinking of his flower. Chapter sixteen. So then. The seventh planet was the Earth. The Earth is not just a normal planet. There are 111 kings, not forgetting the African kings among them, 7,000 geographers, 900,000 businessmen, 7,500,000 alcoholics, 311 million proud men. That is to say, about two billion grown-ups. To give you an idea of the size of Earth, I will tell you that before electricity, it was necessary to have 462,511 lamplighters. Over the whole of the six continents, it needed 462,511 lamplighters. Seen from a slight distance, that would make an excellent show. The movements of this army would be controlled like those of the ballet in the opera. First would come the turn of the lamplighters of New Zealand and Australia. Having set the light of their lamps, these would go off to sleep. Next, the lamplighters of China and Siberia would enter for their steps in the dance, and then they too would go backstage. After that would come the turn of the lamplighters of Russia and the Indies, then those of Africa and Europe, then those of South America, then those of North America. And never would they make a mistake in the order of their entry on the stage. It would be amazing. Only the man who was in charge of the single lamp at the North Pole and his friend who was responsible for the single lamp at the South Pole, only these two would live freely. They would be busy twice a year. Chapter Seventeen. When one wishes to play the wit, he sometimes walks a little from the truth. I have not been fully honest in what I have told you about the lamplighters, and I realize that I gave a false idea of our planet to those who do not know it. Men occupy a very small place on Earth. If the two billion people on its surface were all to stand upright, they could easily be put into one public square, 32 kilometer long and 32 kilometer wide. They are sometimes crowded together, as they do for some big public gatherings. All humanity could be piled up on a small Pacific island. 
The grown-ups will not believe you when you tell them that. They imagine that they will fill a great deal of space. They wish for themselves as important as the Baobabs. You should advise them to make their own calculations. They love figures, and that will please them. But do not waste your time on this extra task. It is unnecessary. You have trust in me. When the little prince arrived on the earth, he was very much surprised not to see any people. He was beginning to be afraid he had come to the wrong planet. At that time, a coil of gold flashed across the sand. Good evening, said the little prince gently. Good evening, said the snake. What planet is this on which I have come down? asked the little prince. This is Earth. This is Africa, the snake answered. Ah, there are no people on the earth? This is the desert. There are no people in the desert. The earth is large, said the snake. The little prince sat down on a stone and raised his eyes toward the sky. I wonder if the stars are alight in heaven so that one day each one of us may find his own star again, he said. Look at my planet. It is right there above us. But how far away it is. It is beautiful, the snake said. What has brought you here? I have been having some trouble with a flower, said the little prince. Ah, said the snake. And they were both silent. Where are the men? The little prince at last took up the conversation again. It is a little lonely in the desert. It is also lonely among men, the snake said. The little prince stared at him for a long time. You are a funny animal, he said at last. You are no thicker than a finger. But I am more powerful than the finger of a king, said the snake. The little prince smiled. You are not very powerful. You haven't even any feet. You cannot even travel. I can carry you farther than any ship could take you, said the snake. He twisted himself around the little prince's ankle like a golden chain. Whomever I touch, I send back to the earth from where he came. The snake spoke again. But you are pure and true, and you come from a star. You move me to pity. You are so weak on this earth made of stone, the snake said. I can help you someday. If you grow too homesick for your own planet, I can... Oh, I understand you very well, said the little prince. But why do you always speak in riddles? I solve them all, said the snake. And they were both silent. Chapter 18 The little prince crossed the desert and met with only one flower. It was a flower with three petals, a flower of no importance at all. Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the flower. Where are the men? The little prince asked gently. The flower had once seen people passing. Men, she echoed. I think there are six or seven of them alive. I saw them several years ago, but no one ever knows where to find them. The wind blows them away. They have no roots, and that makes their life very difficult. Goodbye, said the little prince. Goodbye, said the little prince. Goodbye, said the flower. Chapter 19 After that, the little prince climbed a high mountain. The only mountains he had ever known were the three volcanoes which came up to his knees and he used the dead volcano as a chair. From a mountain as high as this one, he said to himself, I shall be able to see the whole planet at one and all the people. But he saw nothing but peaks of rock that were sharpened like needles. Good morning, he said gently. Good morning, good morning, good morning, answered the echo. Who are you? said the little prince. Who are you? Who are you? Who are you? answered the echo. Be my friends. I am all alone, he said. 
I am all alone, all alone, all alone, answered the echo. What an odd planet, he thought. It is completely dry and pointed and tough and grim, and the people have no imagination. They repeat whatever one says to them. On my planet, I had a flower. She was always the first to speak. Chapter 20 But it happened that after walking for a long time through sand and rocks, at last, the little prince came upon a road, and all roads lead to the houses of men. Good morning, he said. He was standing before the rose garden. Good morning, said the roses. The little prince looked at them. They all looked like his flower. Who are you? he demanded, shocked. We are roses, the roses said. And he was overcome with sadness. His flower had told him that she was the only one of her kind in all the universe, and there were 5,000 of them in one single garden. She would be very much annoyed, he said to himself. If she should see that, she would cough most extremely, and she would pretend that she was dying, and I should be forced to pretend that I was nursing her back to life. If I did not do that, to teach me also, she would really allow herself to die. Then he went on with his thoughts. I thought that I was rich, with a flower that was unique in all the world, but all I had was a common rose common rose and three volcanoes that come up to my knees, and one of them perhaps dead forever. That doesn't make me a very great prince. And he lay down in the grass and cried. Chapter 21 It was then that the fox appeared. Good morning, said the fox. Good morning, the little prince responded politely, although when he turned around, he saw nothing. I am right here, the voice said, under the apple tree. Who are you? asked the little prince and added, you are very pretty to look at. I am a fox, the fox said. Come and play with me, proposed the little prince. I am so unhappy. I cannot play with you, the fox said. I am not Tamed. Ah, sorry, said the little prince, but after some thought, he added, What does that mean? Tame. You do not live here, said the fox. What are you looking for? I am looking for men, said the little prince. What does that mean? Tame. Men, said the fox. They have guns and they hunt. It is very worrying. They also raise chickens. These are their only interests. Are you looking for chickens? No, said the little prince. I am looking for friends. What does that mean? Tame. It is an act too often ignored, said the fox. It means to build up ties. To build up ties? Just that, said the fox. To me, you are still nothing more than a little boy who is just like a hundred thousand other little boys, and I have no need of you. Also, you have no need of me. To you, I am nothing more than a fox, like a hundred thousand other foxes. But if you tame me, then we shall need each other. To me, you will be unique in all the world. To you, I shall be unique in all the world. I am beginning to understand, said the little prince. There is a flower. I think that she has tamed me. It is possible, said the fox. On earth, all kinds of things happen. Oh, but this is not earth, said the little prince. The fox seemed confused and very interested. On another planet? Yes. Are there hunters on that planet? No. Ah, that is interesting. Are there chickens? 
No. Hmm. Nothing is perfect, sighed the fox. But he came back to his idea. My life is unchanging, the fox said. I hunt chickens, men hunt me. All the chickens are just alike and all the men are just alike. And as a result, I am a little bored. But if you tame me, it will be the sun came to shine on my life. I shall know the sound of a step that will be different from all the others. Other steps send me back under the ground, but your steps will call me out of my shelter. And then look, you see the grain fields over there? I do not eat bread. Wheat is no use to me. The wheat fields have nothing to say to me. And that is sad, but you have golden hair. Think about it when you tamed me. The golden grain will bring me back the thought of you and I shall love to listen to the wind in the wheat. The fox stared at the prince for a long time. Please tame me, the fox said. I want to very much, the little prince replied, but I don't have much time. I have friends to find and a great many things to understand. Men only understand the things that he tames, said the fox. Men have no more time to understand anything. They buy things already made at the shops, but there is no shop where one can buy friendship, and so men have no friends anymore. If you want a friend, tame me. What must I do to tame you? asked the little prince. You must be very patient, replied the fox. First, you will sit down at a little distance from me in the grass. I shall look at you out of the corner of my eye and you will say nothing. Words are the source of misunderstandings, but you will sit a little closer to me every day. The next day, the little prince came back. It would have been better to come back at the same hour said the fox. For example, if you came at four o'clock in the afternoon, then at three o'clock I shall begin to be happy. I shall feel happier and happier as the hour advances. But if you come at just any time, I shall never know at what hour my heart is to be ready to greet you. One must keep the right ceremony. What is a ceremony? asked the little prince. Those also are actions too often ignored, said the fox. The ceremony is what make one day different from other days, one hour from other hours. For example, there is a ceremony among my hunters. Every Thursday they dance with the village girls. So Thursday is a wonderful day for me. I can take a walk as far as the vineyards, but if the hunters danced at any time, Every day would be like every other day, and I should never have any vacation at all. So the little prince tamed the fox, and when the hour of his leaving came closer, Ah, said the fox, I shall cry. It is your own fault, said the little prince. I never wished you any sort of harm, but you wanted me to tame you. Yes, that is so, said the fox. But now you are going to cry, said the little prince. Yes, that is so, said the fox. Then it has done you no good at all. It has done me good because of the golden wheat fields, said the fox. And then he added, go and look again at the roses. You will understand now that your rose is unique in all the world. Then come back to say goodbye to me and I will make you a present of a secret. The little prince went away to look again at the roses. You are not at all like my rose, he said. No one has tamed you and you have tamed no one. You are like my fox when I first knew him. He was only a fox like a hundred thousand other foxes, but I have made him my friend. And now 
He is unique in all the world. And the roses were very much ashamed. You are beautiful, but you are empty, he went on. No one could die for you. Ordinary people would think that my rose looked just like you. But she is more important than all the hundreds of you other roses, because it is she that I have watered. Put under the glass cup, sheltered behind the screen, killed the worms, except the two or three that we saved to become butterflies. And I have listened to when she complained or said prideful things, or even sometimes when she said nothing, because she is my rose. And he went back to meet the fox. Goodbye, he said. Goodbye, said the fox. And now, here is my secret. It is only with the heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. What is essential is invisible to the eye. The little prince repeated so that he would be sure to remember. You have wasted time for your rose. That makes your rose so important. Chapter 22 Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the railway switchman. What do you do here? The little prince asked. I make packs of travelers in groups of a thousand, said the switchman. And I send off the trains with the groups. Now to the right, now to the left. And an express train full of light shook the switchman's cabin as it rushed by with a loud sound like thunder. They are in a great hurry, said the little prince. What are they looking for? Not even the engineer driver knows that, said the switchman. And the second express train full of light thundered by in the opposite direction. Are they coming back already? demanded the little prince. These are not the same ones, said the switchman. It is an exchange. Were they not satisfied where they were? asked the little prince. No one is ever satisfied where he is said the switchman. And they heard the sound of thunder of a third fully lighted express. Are they following the first travelers? demanded the little. They are following nothing at all, said the switchman. They are asleep in there, or if they are not asleep, they are yawning. Only the children are flattening their noses against the windows. Only the children know what they are looking for, said the little prince. They waste their time over a doll, and it becomes very important to them, and if anybody takes it away from them, they cry. They are lucky, the switchman said. Chapter 23 Good morning, said the little prince. Good morning, said the merchant. This was a merchant who sold pills that doesn't feel thirsty. You only need to take one pill a week, and you will not be thirsty. Why are you selling those? asked the little prince. Because they save a huge amount of time, said the merchant. With these pills, you save 53 minutes in every week. This result was calculated by experts. And what do I do with those 53 minutes? Anything you like. If I had 53 minutes to spend as I liked, said the little prince to himself. I should walk towards a spring of fresh water. Chapter 24 It was now the eighth day since I had had my accident in the desert. I had listened to the story of the merchant. I was drinking the last drop of my water. Ah, oh, I said to the little prince, these memories of yours are very sweet. But I have not yet repaired my plane. I have no more to drink, and I should be very happy if I could walk toward a spring of fresh water. My friend, the fox, the little prince said to me. My dear little man, this is not a matter of anything to do with the fox. Why not? 
because I am about to die of thirst. He did not follow my thought, and he answered me, It is a good thing to have had a friend. Even if we are about to die, I am very glad to have had a fox as a friend. Oh, he has no way of guessing the danger, I said to myself. He has never been either hungry or thirsty. But he looked at me steadily and replied to my thought, I am thirsty too. Let us look for a well. I made a gesture of tiredness. It is strange to look for a well in the huge size of the desert. Nevertheless, we started walking. When we had walked slowly along for several hours, the darkness fell and the stars began to come out. Thirst had made me a little fevered, so I looked at stars as if I were in a dream. The little prince's last words came back into my memory. Then you are thirsty too? I demanded. But he did not reply to my question. He only said to me, Water may also be good for the heart. I did not understand his answer, but I said nothing. I knew very well that it was impossible to ask again. He was tired. He sat down. I sat down beside him, and he spoke again. The stars are beautiful because of a flower that cannot be seen. I replied, yes, that is so. And I looked across the hills of sand without saying anything more. The hills of sand were laid down before us in the moonlight. The desert is beautiful, the little prince said. And that was true. I have always loved the desert. While sitting down on the desert sand, see nothing, hear nothing. But through the silence, something moves and shines. What makes the desert beautiful? said the little prince, is that somewhere it hides a well. I was surprised by a sudden understanding of that secret of the sands. The desert is beautiful because there is water one cannot see. When I was a little boy, I lived in an old house and legend told us there was a treasure. No one had ever known how to find it but the legend cast a spell over that house. My home was hiding a secret in the depths of its heart. Yes, I said to the little prince. The house, the stars, the desert, what gives them their beauty is something that is invisible. I am glad, he said, that you agree with my fox. As the little prince dropped off to sleep, I took him in my arms and set out walking once more. I felt deeply touched. It seemed to me that I was carrying a very fragile treasure. It seemed to me that there was nothing more fragile on all earth. In the moonlight, I looked at his forehead, his clothed eyes, his hair that moved in the wind, and I said to myself, what I see here is nothing but a shell. What is most important is invisible. The little prince smiles. I say to myself again, what touches my heart about this little prince who is sleeping here is his loyalty to a flower. I can see how he loves the flower. And I felt him to be more weak I felt the need of protecting him as if he himself were like a fire that will blow out by a little wind. And as I walked on so, I found water in the morning. Chapter 25 Men, said the little prince, set off by express trains, but they do not know what they are looking for. Then they rush about and get excited and turn round and round. And he added, it is not worth the trouble. The well that we found was not like the wells of the Sahara. The wells of the Sahara are just holes dug in the sand. This one was like a well in a village. 
but there was no village here, and I thought I must be dreaming. It is strange, I said to the little prince. Everything is ready for use. The well wheel, the bucket, the rope. He laughed, touched the rope, and set the well wheel to working. And the well wheel made a noise, like an old weather vane which shows the wind direction. Do you hear? said the little prince. We have awakened the well, and it is singing. I did not want him to tire himself with the rope. Leave this rope to me, I said. It is too heavy for you. I pulled the bucket slowly to the edge of the well and set it there. I felt tired but happy because I did my job. The song of the well wheel was still in my ears, and I could see the sunlight lighting the still shaking water. I am thirsty for this water, said the little prince. Give me some of it to drink. And I understood what he had been looking for. I raised the bucket to his lips. He drank, his eyes closed. It was as sweet as some special festival treat. This water was indeed different from ordinary water. Its sweetness was born of the walk under the stars, the song of the well wheel, the effort of my arms. It was good for the heart, like a present. When I was a little boy, the lights of the Christmas tree, the music of church worship, the kindness of smiling faces, used to make up the happiness of the gifts I received. The men where you live raise five thousand roses in the garden, said the little prince, but they do not find in it what they are looking for. They do not find it, I replied. Ah, but what they are looking for could be found in one single rose or in a little water. Yes, that is true, I said. And the little prince added, But the eyes are blind. One must look with the heart. I had drunk the water. I breathed easily. At sunrise, the sand is the color of honey, and that honey color was making me happy too. What brought me then this sense of heartbreak? You must keep your promise, said the little prince as he sat down beside me once more. What promise? You know, a mask for my sheep. I am responsible for this flower. I took my ruff of drawings out of my pocket. The little prince looked them over and laughed as he said, Your baobabs, they look a little like cabbages. Oh, really? Um, your fox, his ears look a little like horns, and they are too long. And he laughed again. You are not fair, little prince, I said. I don't know how to draw anything except a boa snake from the outside and from the inside. Oh, that will be all right, he said. Children understand. So then I made a pencil sketch of a mask, and... As I gave it to him, my heart was broken. You have plans that I do not know about, I said. But he did not answer me. He said to me instead, You know, my falling to the earth, tomorrow will be its anniversary. Then, after a silence, he went on. I came down very near here, and he turned red. And once again, without understanding why, I had a strange sense of sorrow. But one question came up to me. You were walking alone, a thousand miles from any town. Then it was not by chance that in the morning when I first met you a week ago, you were on your way back to the place where you landed? The little prince turned red again. And I added, with some delay, Perhaps it was because of the anniversary? The little prince turned red once more. He never answered questions. But when one's face changed, that means, yes? Ah, I said to him, I am a little frightened. But he stopped me. 
Now you must work. You must return to your engine. I will be waiting for you here. Come back tomorrow evening. But I was not comfortable. I remembered the fox. If you are tamed by someone, you could get teary eyed. Chapter twenty six. Beside the well, there was part of an old stone wall. When I came back from my work the next evening, I saw my little prince from a little distance. He was sitting on top of a wall, with his feet dropping, and I heard him say, "Then you don't remember. This is not the exact spot." Another voice must have answered him, for he replied to it. Yes, yes, it is the right day, but this is not the place. I continued my walk toward the wall. I did not see or hear anyone, but the little prince replied once again. Exactly, you will see where my track begins, in the sand. You have nothing to do but wait for me there. I shall be there tonight. I was only twenty meters from the wall, and I still saw nothing. After a silence, the little prince spoke again. "You have good poison. You are sure that it will not make me hurt for too long." I stopped in my tracks. My heart was broken to pieces, but still, I did not understand. Now go away. Said the little prince, "I want to get down from the wall." I dropped my eyes to the foot of the wall, and I jumped into the air. In front of me was a yellow snake that can kill life in thirty seconds. Even as I was getting my revolver, I stepped back fast. But at the noise I made, the snake let himself move across the sand and, in no hurry, disappeared. With a light sound between the stones, I reached the wall just in time to catch my little man in my arms. His face was white as snow. What does this mean? I demanded. Why are you talking with snakes? I had untied the golden scarf that he always wore. I had wetted the side of his forehead and had given him some water to drink. And now I did not dare ask him any more questions. He looked at me very seriously and put his arms around my neck. I felt his heart beating like the heart of a dying bird shot with someone's gun. I am glad that you have found what was wrong with your engine," he said. "Now you can go back home." How do you know about that? I was coming to tell him that my work was successful, better than I had expected. He made no answer to my question, but he added, "I am also going back home today." Then, sadly, it is much farther. It is much more difficult. I realized that an unexpected something was happening. I was holding him close in my arms as if he were a little child, and yet. It seemed to me that he was rushing headlong into a deep place where I could not stop him. His look was very serious, like someone lost far away. I have your sheep, and I have the sheep's box, and I have the mask. And he gave me a sad smile. I waited for a long time. I could see that he was getting well, little by little. Dear little man. I said to him, "You are afraid." He was afraid. There was no doubt about that. But he laughed lightly. <laughs> I shall be much more afraid this evening. Once again, I felt frozen by the sense of something destroyed, and I knew that I could not hear that laugh any more. For me, it was like a spring of fresh water in the desert. Little man, I said. I want to hear you laugh again. But he said to me, "Tonight it will be a year. My star can be found right above the place where I came to Earth a year ago." Little man, I said, 
Tell me that it is only a bad dream, this event of the snake and the meeting place and the star. But he did not answer my plea. He said to me instead, The thing that is important is the thing that is not seen. Yes, I know. It is just as it is with the flower. If you love a flower that lives on a star, it is sweet to look at the sky at night. All the stars are abloom with flowers. Yes, I know. It is just as it is with the water. Because of the well wheel and the rope, what you gave me to drink was like music. You remember how good it was. Yes, I know. And at night you will look up at the stars where I live. Everything is so small that I cannot show you where my star is to be found. But it is better because my star will just be one of the stars for you. And so you will love to watch all the stars in the heavens. They will all be your friends. And besides, I am going to make you a present. He laughed again. Ah, little prince, dear little prince, I love to hear that laugh. That is my present, just that. It will be as it was when we drank the water. What are you trying to say? All men have the stars, he answered, but they are not the same stars for different people. For some who are travelers, the stars are guides. For others, they are no more than little lights in the sky. For others who are scholars, they are problems. For my businessmen, they were wealth. But all these stars are silent. You will have the stars as no one else has them. What are you trying to say? In one of the stars, I shall be living. In one of them, I shall be laughing. And so it will be as if all the stars were laughing when you look at the sky at night. You will have stars that can laugh. And he laughed again. And when your sorrow is comforted, you will be happy that you have known me. You will always be my friend. You will want to laugh with me, and you will sometimes open your window for that pleasure. And your friends will be surely surprised to see you laughing as you look up at the sky. Then you will say to them, Yes, the stars always make me laugh, and they will think you are crazy. It will be a very cheap trick that I shall have played on you. And he laughed again. Instead of stars, I had given you a great number of little bells that knew how to laugh. And he laughed again. Then he quickly became serious. Tonight, you know, do not come. I shall not leave you, I said. I shall look as if I were suffering. I shall look a little as if I were dying. It is like that. Do not come to see that. It is not worth the trouble. I shall not leave you. But he was worried. I tell you, it is also because of the snake. The snake must not bite you. Snakes are unkind creatures. This one might bite you just for fun. I shall not leave you. But a thought came to comfort him. It is true that they have no more poison for a second bite. That night, I did not see him set out on his way. He got away from me without making a sound. When I succeeded in catching up to him, he was walking along with a quick and steady step. He said to me simply, Ah, you are there. And he took me by the hand, but he was still worrying. It was wrong of you to come. You will suffer. I shall look as if I were dead, but that will not be true. I said nothing. You understand. It is too far. I cannot carry this body. It is too heavy. I said nothing. But it will be like an old empty shell. There is nothing sad about 
old shells. I said nothing. He was a little discouraged, but he made one more effort. You know, it will be very nice. I shall look at the stars too. All the stars will be wells with an old well wheel. All the stars will pour fresh water for me to drink. I said nothing. That will be so interesting. You will have five hundred million little bells, and I shall have five hundred million springs of fresh water. And he too said nothing more, because he was crying. Here it is. Let me go on by myself. And he sat down, because he was afraid. Then he said again, "You know, my flower. I am responsible for her, and she is so weak. She is so naive. She has four thorns to protect herself against all the world." I too sat down, because I was not able to stand up any longer. There now, that is all. He still paused a little. Then he got up. He took one step. I could not move. There was nothing but a flash of yellow close to his ankle. He didn't move for an instant. He did not cry out. He fell as gently as a tree falls. There was not even any sound because of the sand. Chapter twenty-seven. And now, six years have already gone by. I have never yet told this story. The friends who met me on my return were pleased to see me alive. I was sad, but I told them, "I am tired." Now my sorrow is comforted a little, but not completely. I know that he did go back to his planet because I did not find his body in the early morning. It was not such a heavy body, and at night I love to listen to the stars. It is like five hundred million little bells. But there is one strange thing. When I drew the mask for the little prince, I forgot to add the leather strap to it. He will never have been able to fasten it on his sheep. So now I keep wondering, what is happening on his planet? Perhaps the sheep has eaten the flower. At one time I say to myself,、huh, "Surely not." The little prince shuts his flower under her glass cup every night, and he watches over his sheep very carefully. Then I am happy, and there is sweetness in the laughter of all the stars. But at another time I say to myself. At some moment, he forgot the glass cup, or the sheep got out without making any noise in the night, and then the little bells are changed to tears. Here is a great mystery. You who also love the little prince, and for me, nothing can be the same if a sheep we never saw has, yes or no, eaten a rose. Look up at the sky. Ask yourselves: Is it yes or no? Has the sheep eaten the flower? And you will see how everything changes. And grown-up will never understand that this is a matter of so much importance. This is the loveliest and saddest landscape in the world. It is the same as that on the previous page, but I have drawn it again to impress it on your memory. It is here that the little prince appeared on Earth and disappeared. Look at it carefully, so that you will be sure to remember it in case you travel some day to the African desert. Look at it carefully, so that you will be sure to remember it in case you travel some day to the African desert. And if you should come upon the spot, please do not hurry on. Then, if a little man appears who laughs, who has golden hair, you will know who he is. If this should happen, send me word that he has come back.